Okay. And then I will let some people in. Excellent. Hello. Hi, everybody who's joining us. Um, I think a few people are coming into the room now. Hi there, Philip. Hi. Excellent. Yeah, there's a few people coming coming in now, and um, hopefully we'll get a few more. Uh, which, I was just explaining to Azzy, who's, who's here to talk to us today, that it's a slightly different um, time of day that we're doing this. So sometimes I do these talks a bit later in the evening, but we're going across a, a time zone here, aren't we? So um, as, as we are going across the time zone, I think we've just adjusted the time scale. So I don't know if we'll get our usual crowd join. I think often the after work crowd here in the UK, at least. <laughs> and so, you know, we're hoping for a few numbers, but if it's just a more intimate chat in some ways, that's, that's quite nice because it gives us all the chance to have that bit of open floor discussion and, um, you know, hand over to one another about our own thoughts. I, I kind of like to keep these sessions a bit Relax and informal because I feel like as a community we're all sort of valuable in what we have to add and everyone comes at these things with different experiences and perspectives and I love the opportunity of everyone being able to learn from one another rather than sort of you know certainly not me speaking because I'm definitely not an expert in many things you know <laughs> I have a couple of niches but I'm, I'm you know I'm not someone who feels like I know even a fraction of what a lot of the people around me know. So I'm always excited to learn from each other. But we do have Azzy as a, a key speaker today to sort of kickstart a little bit of information about pangolins. So like I said, I'm gonna give it a couple more minutes, but we are recording today, um, just so everyone knows. And that's only so that once I have recorded, hi Carol, we've got another person joining. Um, once I have recorded the session, the idea is I'm going to put it out on a blog post and across my YouTube channel after this. Um, so just to make you aware, um, but you are welcome to have your videos on when we're in the sort of going to have a bit of an open floor. So please do put your videos on and we'll sort of immerse and chat to one another. Um, where are we at? We're few minutes in so we'll give it a couple more minutes I usually sort of wait until about five minutes in but um yeah I'm looking forward to this it's, it's nice to kind of quit chatting on things uh I don't know if anyone's joining us from the UK today but but if you are I hope that you're you're doing okay in these storms I was just explaining I'm facing a window in where I sit in in certainly in this room this is <laughs> in this room in the house I don't usually use this room but my children are on home for it at their on half term so they're at home at the moment and um i'm in this room i'm facing a window and so i'm sort of watching the storm unfold as i'm here <laughs> i've already lost my bird table went flying off down that way a few minutes ago um <laughs> and my neighbor's dustbins are blowing across the road so i'm half keeping an <laughs> eye on what's going on outside so if you do hear any sort of strange whistling noises or anything like that it's just the wind <laughs> I've got a I've got a tree out front, so fingers crossed that it doesn't end up going down during this. <laughs> Very dramatic, wouldn't it? But uh, yeah, I hope everyone's uh, on this. You know, this part of the UK is is doing okay at the moment. Uh, yes. Right then, I guess I'll kick off. So I guess everybody pretty knows who I am. Um, there we go. We'll just admit another person there. Sorry, I got a few people coming in still. So. Um, yeah, just probably people know who I am, but just in case I'll do a little rundown. I'm not going to talk too much myself about pangolins and um, their plight, or at least not yet, because um, like I said, that's going to hand over to Azzy for that one. So I will just give a little bit of context and I'll share my screen now. Um, just a little bit. So this is me. I am. Kate Stevenson or Kate on Conservation, most people know me as. My background is in journalism and as a blogger and an editor. Um, I'm not a scientist. I like to put that caveat in because like I say, I'm certainly not um, someone who feels like they're an expert in these things. I'm very fortunate that I get surrounded by experts <laughs> and I learn a lot and I like to try and learn as much as I can. But my background really is in sort of storytelling and um, news journalism and magazine journalism. And that's kind of how I come at conservation is looking at conservation from the perspective of storytelling and how we can use communications as a strength to um, add that extra tool into sort of conservation. 
Um, so here's a quote. I don't know if you guys can see this. I've got this in a way, have I? Um, can you see my screen all right? I don't have all these windows up on this, your side, do I? Yes. The okay. screen, we can see your screen good. Perfect. Okay, doke. So my favorite sort of <laughs> quote about um, communications is uh, comes from none other than Sir David Attenborough himself, who says, um, saving our planet is now a communications challenge. If people lose knowledge, sympathy, and understanding of the natural world, they're going to mistreat it and will not ask their politicians to care for it. Now, this is one of the most important quotes I feel has been out there and been said in the last couple of years. Um, David, so David Admiral said this when he joined Instagram. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think it's vital. I think we're in a day and age where it's not just about sort of communicating to the public for the sake of public knowledge, although that is obviously incredibly important. What we want to happen is to tra translate that public knowledge into um, action and lobbying of politicians. You know, the more that people know, the more that they can stand up for, the more they can speak out, protest, sign petitions, you know, lobby their local MPs, um, and really try and make movement at government level. Because I feel like as much as, unfortunately, the media, as much as anyone, and, and big corporations, perhaps the most, like to put the onus on the individual. And I think there's a big trend in saying it's down to you as an individual to change your habits. Yes, that's important. But realistically, change is only going to happen at a governmental level. So when it comes to the, the plight of the pangolin, um, I think that's probably one of the most important things is to try and keep pressure on at a governmental level. And I think this quote by Sir David certainly sums that up. Um, so basic pangolin facts. I mean, I don't know, hopefully you've seen pangolins before, at least in pictures. I've never seen one in real life. I don't think, you know, many people I know actually have, but um, if you're not aware, they are these sort of, they call them the scaly anteaters, you know, the sort of the scaly anteaters of the uh, animal world is, is sort of how people <laughs> certainly help children to identify them. Um, there are eight species of pangolin in the world and all eight are unfortunately endangered. Um, and the biggest threat, of course, as with many of these wild animals, is humans, and uh, in particular poaching for their scales. As I say, I will hand over to Azzy today, who's kindly come to talk to us about her um, experience in uh, sort of raising awareness and, and sort of activism in that um, context of the illegal wildlife trade and trying to stop that trade from happening. Um, as he has a background in design and moved on to technology throughout her career, again, at a high sort of governmental type level, and um, is sort of using that to, to move back into, I think is it fair to say, move back into the artistic and, and design element of what you do and bring those elements together. So without further ado, I will hand over and I will allow you to be a host so that you can also share your screen as well. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you for the lovely introduction as well. My pleasure. Hello, everyone. I'm Ozzy, and I'm so happy to be here on this Celebrating World Pangolin Day and sharing some information about pangolins here and how you can help, how possibly different kinds of technologies and different kind of, kind of collaborative efforts can help the pangolins. A little bit about me, as Kate mentioned, my background ranges from art to fashion design to technology and within the world of technology, specifically robotics and bio-inspired artificial intelligence within the governmental area. So within the Department of Defense of robotics helicopters, for example, that are innovative that can land on their own. And I'm also a member of Kate on conservation and nature maker crowd and also the wildlife blogger crowd. So let's get to pangolins. 
these beautiful science fiction like creatures. They're extremely unique. They've been around for, they're prehistoric. They've been around for 80 million years. They're the only mammal with their entire body full of scales. And as you can see in this image, that's a, a close up. It's just incredible. The scale, how from the, the face area, this starts with tiny little scales and then they become large scales. So just incredible pattern in this absolutely unique animal. They curl up and the, the purpose of the scale is to protect them when they see a predator, the normal predators that they see this, this works very well when as they curl up in a ball, they're absolutely harmless. They eat termites and ants, which is actually good for people as termites can destroy homes and they cannot see, they have very poor eyesight. Their main um, way to be aware of what's going on is by the sense of smell. So a couple of these really, I'll get into the slide of what is happening to them but a couple of these characteristics really is not good for them and it helps the human predators as they just curl up in a ball and they cannot see and someone can just pick them up. Very easy. A bit about my effort within the company Fashwand. So after my career in technology, I decided I wanted to bring design, bring in technology, innovation, collaboration, program management, all the experiences that I've had and expertise, put them together and see how I can help wildlife. From the start, all my paintings, designs, even the technology world was inspired by nature and specifically by different kinds of wildlife, including ants, as my dissertation was about the ant colony optimization. So always I've been fascinated by them I wanted to see how I can help them. Especially, I'm very much concerned with the wildlife crime, with what is happening with poachers and even within the hunting world. And here's a bit of introduction of the Wildlife Jewels collection that I launched. These paintings, I put a few of them here. For example, the Spixus macaw, who is unfortunately extinct, birds of paradise, elephants, rhinos, and now the pangolin, which I'll get into on the next slide, they started from paintings when I was in undergrad. And then when I launched a company, Fash Wand, I've been transforming these paintings into fashion from casual sports to couture gowns and luxury fashion items. The main purpose, again, is to raise awareness about these beautiful, rare, and dangerous species and to inspire the people, inspire the world for change and see that luxury and beautiful fashion can actually help wildlife rather than a traditional way of using, for example, wildlife parts into fashion items. And we collaborate with wildlife conservation foundations, provide all the way from proceeds, collaborating with research, funding, funding research, funding technologies, and also donating products. And here is a sneak peek into the pangolin collection, specially designed for this World Pangolin Day. It's the start of the collection. Here is the wildlife jewels paint, uh, an image of the painting. And uh, you can also see an image of a, uh, an example of the home decoration with the glass coasters and the pangolin inspired tunic top, which is an applique embroidered. So this kind of shows a, a little bit sample of how the inspiration from the pangolin and within the wildlife jewels collection within different wildlife transforms into art and then transforms into different fashion items. That is the mission is to help save wildlife. Now a bit about technology and wildlife bots. Wildlife bots, basically technology for wildlife. It's, I, as I mentioned, since grad school that I started the, uh, getting into the world of technology and computer science. It was all inspired by nature. What, what is going on in nature? Lots of innovative technologies are actually inspired by nature. Animals, wildlife are helping us. Birds, different kinds of parrots, for example, the way they fly, the way they land are being researched within, within different organizations. And my background within the within the Navy research and 
had ex some experience within what, what I saw, for example, within DARPA and National Science Foundation. It's just incredible how advanced technology is. And it's been grown from, uh, advanced from inspirations by nature. But how can we use this technology, all these technologies that are advanced and innovative and use them for the good of wildlife? How can we put them all together? That is really the main uh, that was the main inspiration why I started Wildlife Bots, not only to research different technologies, but also how can they collaborate? How can we bring in technology from other organizations, from, for example, within the government, within Department of Defense, within government, within the health sec sector? How can we bring those technologies that are already mature, that can track poachers, that can track wildlife, that can help, help us? tackle the, the battle of wildlife crime. So what is happening to the pangolins? As uh, you may already know, they're the most trafficked mammal in the world. One million pangolins have been poached in the last 10 years. And in an article I, I read that about one, at least one pangolin every five minutes is being killed. Why are they killed for? As Kate previously also mentioned, they're killed for medicine, all the way from different kinds of medicine to luxury goods. As you can see some images here, uh, you can find more info about these images and, and uh, the context of it on, at worldwildlifefund.org. And also food status, food for status. So it's un absolutely unbelievable that the the pangolin, they eat them for, for status. And also there, as you can see with the boot, they're used for different kinds of products that are called luxury goods. That's a completely different form of luxury than how I view luxury. And um, also for medicine, for, for medicine, even though their scales are made of nothing more than our nails. So it, it is, there's no scientific evidence be, beside, behind this. And the highest demand is in China and Vietnam. What is even more concerning is not only that, not only are they being poached to that degree, but the poachers are using technology. I mentioned in the wildlife bot slide how we need to use technology to help save wildlife. So we need to put together technology to help them, but at the same time, the technology is being used against them. And in this case, poachers are using the intelligent trafficking routes across the globe. They're, they're being able to sell their products and communicate within their own network and their buyers online. And that is really concerning. That's an area to we, re, we need to focus on to see how can we track down the, the routes through, through technology, these online sales, how can we ban them from having social media? And it is very challenging as they can just create another account, for example. But one way I, I was mentioning that we need to look at this in a large perspective and a collaborative way to bring together expertise and professions with, within different professions, within the world of cybersecurity, for example, within other sectors, there's a lot more advanced ways of catching criminals on, online on the internet. We need to be using those the skills and the expertise that are already out there together to see how we can tackle this problem. And collaboration. So what do we really need? What is one of the ways that we can help with uh, pang pangolins as well as with the other illegal wildlife trade and poachers and criminals? We need more collaboration. We need cross-organizational collaboration and partnerships. As I mentioned, technology is one part of it, but there's also the legal aspect of things. We need the researchers at the universities, for example, to be able to advance their products quicker. In a lot of ways, products, technologies develop, but the laws are not there. There's no legal way to control the laws, but we need, we need more partnerships and collaborations. We also need more policies. We need more strict global policies that, that enforces laws and bans and policies to stop wildlife crime. I know the End Wildlife Initiative, End Wildlife Crime Initiative is, um, is 
launching and that is definitely towards the good direction, but we really need more collaboration. We need even an organization that oversees wildlife crime. For example, within a technology world, they would be doing research such as the wildlife bots, for example, as an, this is just one little part of it, but for example, they would be doing this cross organizational global collab global organization would be looking into different technologies that are used at different sectors and bring them together, some, some joining organization. What are some steps that you can do, individuals can do to help the pangolins? Here are some of my thoughts. Again, joining global organizations that are already working to end wildlife crime, that already are experts in the field, that are knowledgeable for, within the world of trafficking and within how poachers work. Collaborate with tech experts. That again is a big one to be able to use technology for wildlife, technology that is already advanced in other fields that has already been tested. We don't necessarily need to develop new technology. Consult with global policymakers and develop global laws that can be enforced and implemented. This is a huge need and this is urgent. This is not something that there's time for. And again, be alert online and look out for pangolin, in, specifically about pangolins, look out for pangolin products and report them. And I've done some research on this. I have a, I have a link and information that you can click on, on the link and provide, if you, if you see something that looks like a pangolin product, you can actually report them. And how you can learn more about my pangolin inspired work, visit fashwan.com and I'm also on Instagram, fashwan.byozzy. Feel free to email me if you have any questions and that's my presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Kate. Sorry, I was still muted. Thank you so much for that. It's um, <laughs> interesting, so interesting to hear a different perspective of, of how you're spreading a message. Um, obviously from my side, I write and, and share sort of social media posts, but predominantly write in, in magazines and online. So it's really interesting for me to see how you can use different mediums to sort of reach out to different audiences and sort of speak about pangolins or even let people know that these animals exist because um, that's something that I think often can get overlooked and especially when a lot of the circles that we move in within social media is people who are similar to us who maybe have similar um, levels of knowledge to ourselves about these things and it can be really easy to forget that potentially people don't even know that these animals exist um, again, my career background has included working on um, content and news uh, for children. So I've worked at National Geographic Kids Magazine and Discovery Education, which was a branch of Discovery Channel that went into school, goes into schools in the UK. And, um, you know, when you talk to children, you suddenly realise that you have, have to talk at a level of, you know, perhaps they have never heard of this before. And it sort of, for me, allowed me to gain quite a perspective that actually, it's not just children there are a lot of people out there that for various reasons you know whether it be um to do with where they come from in the world um accessibility to to knowledge and information education um you know their their personal situations it can be very hard to be tuned in to sort of what goes on with within the wildlife sector and um i think that's a you know an interesting thing that with something like potentially fashion um, and home decor, et cetera, you're sort of reaching people who might not even move in those circles of like going to my blog to read about wildlife. You know, you're reaching people who are potentially consumers of, of fashion, consumers of, of, you know, products in their home that, that are being exposed to this in a new way. And I think as such, it's kind of nice. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about um, pangolins as a as a species because one of the things I've often found um, when you to reach people sort of through my activism or through my sort of educational aspect of what I do is to try and hit like nuggets of information that actually um, might stick so we, we sort of have this this thing certainly within education for children of, of reaching different sort of levels of information and relatability 
So I'm just gonna pop on share my screen again. Uh, this one, I believe it is. Or is it this one? There we go. Um, so yeah, here we, here we see there are, there are eight species of pangolins. And um, as you mentioned, they're found in, Af four are found in Africa and four are found in Asia. And um, to kind of contextualize them, there's a, there's a way that um, you can, tell these species, like uh, the way that you can sort of identify these species is four of them, the four which are found in uh, Asia, their names are related to their, their geographical location. So obviously we have the Chinese pangolin, Philippine pangolin, Indian pangolin, pangolin and the Sunda pangolin. And then in Africa, the pangolin species is named after their prominent characteristics. So you'll have the ground pangolin, the giant pangolin, the white-bellied pangolin, and the black-bellied pangolin. So I always find that very interesting. So if you hear about the name of a pangolin species, if it's a geographical name, then that will be one of the four Asian species. And if it's a characteristic-based name, that will be one of the African species. Just quite a nice little nugget, because you know you might hear the giant pangolin and think, you know, which continent is that from? And hopefully there's a little bit of fact there that, that will stick with some people and help you sort of realize how to identify that. Um, another thing that's really interesting about pangolins, and it's kind of one of those sweet facts that people um, take with them from, from some of these talks and things that I've done, is um, I mentioned earlier about how um, they're, they're called sort of the scaly anteater of the animal kingdom. And another interesting thing is actually they're not very closely related to anteaters at all. They might look a little bit like anteaters um, with scales, but they are more closely related to cats, dogs, and bears, um, which is quite strange because they don't look anything like a cat or a dog or a bear. But sometimes when I've spoken to people outside of those, those animal circles, that is, can be one of the things that sort of um, endears them to an animal such as a pangolin, because when you suddenly realize this is more closely related to your cat or dog at home than it is an anteater, it can, I was gonna say humanize, but it's not really humanize, is it? It can, it can um, bring it down to a level that, that connects with the individual. Um, and then another factoid, many of us know this probably already, so I'm probably to speak preaching to the choir, but you mentioned how um, their scales are essentially the same thing as our fingernails. And I think it's worth sort of, of pointing out that um, that's keratin, keratin, which is exactly the same substance that's used um, that, that is in uh, rhino horns. So obviously rhino horns are, are made of keratin, our fingernails are, and pangolin scales are, and it really does have no medicinal effect whatsoever. So it's used as this sort of traditional form of medicine, but in the same way that, that nobody uses our fingernails or our toenails to sort of cure any of these problems, the medicinal properties of keratin is, is zero. And so it's just such a, awful waste I think that so many animals are impacted and killed for this product that really doesn't have that that use at all um, and another thing that I find quite one of my fun facts about pangolins is um, they have this really huge long tongue again it's very similar to an anteater but their tongue is actually as long as their head and body the length of their head and body and that's another one that like when you're talking to, to kids, especially they love this idea. You know, I've done things like um, games and assemblies and workshops with children where sort of, um, you know, they draw a pangolin and, and then they sort of draw the tongue and stick that on to the, their drawing or whatever, or they make it out of, you know, a, a piece of string or something and they measure up this um, piece of string up against the pangolin's head and body, not the tail, just the head and body. And, and those are sort of quite fun ways to introduce people to, and young people to these animals that, that sort of connect them a little bit more than just this animal on a screen that they maybe have never seen. Um, and their name, their name in Malay comes from a Malay word meaning roller, where they, they roll up into a ball. So if anyone ever wants to sort of share out some fun pangolin facts on their, um, blogs or on their social media or in to their friends or to their friends children or their children or whatever I have you covered <laughs> but on the more serious side um, another thing that kind of maybe could connect us to this species a little bit more is um, 
oh sorry I've gone too far forward there a little bit more is um, to think of them from an environmental perspective so we often find that um, imagery that I see of, of pangolins um, is often this this very upsetting imagery of, of pangolin carcasses in in pits you know these ones that have been confiscated and they end up in a pangolin pit or um, they're in cages being sold at, at a wet market um, which is a, a, a market for, for live animals and um, you know you see this very sort of common um, image of, of what pangolins look like but but it's often not contextualized in how they actually live so I kind of wanted to share a picture here of how a pangolin lives when it's when it's not in a cage or not used as a product or anything else they sort of burrow in the ground and um, to look at their environmental um, advantage, their benefits you know it feels like very unfair to have to give a, an animal an, uh, an environmental benefit to show its value but it is a nice way of um, bringing it to the bigger picture um, because sometimes I find that people who are into the environment aren't necessarily tuned in to animal welfare and vice versa so when you put that together in the same picture sometimes it helps to um, to, to give a, a compassion towards that animal so pangolins environmentally they provide an important service in the form of pest control and soil quality improvement um, you know which is which is vital we know how important soil quality is to you know our, our, our lives whether it be in um, providing uh, vegetation and and more plant diversity which then in turn is um, a provider of biodiversity and different species of animals etc so soil quality is the, the, sort of the linchpin of all of that and um, they they help to improve soil quality their mass consumption of ants and termites actually doubles up as a critical ecosystem function by regulating insect population um, those long snouts they use for digging up food also turn over organic matter and help to oxygenate the soil, which, you know, is, is something that actually I, I didn't really know about until I did a, some research for a blog post I was doing, that they oxygenate the soil just by turning over, and that's probably true of all sort of burrowing animals like that. Um, they create burrows in which to give birth to their young. The process of creating these helps to break up soil and in turn allowing more air and water, that's that oxygenation, to move through the ground. Once they leave their burrows, a whole host of small insects can move in after them. So they, they sort of create a, a ready-made um, habitat for other um, wildlife and insect species to sort of follow in and live there after them. Um, I also really appreciated, I don't know if the next, probably not the next slide, but I also really appreciated that you talked about the um, need for collaboration. Like I said, I'm gonna sort of open the chat up in a moment to sort of give lots of people the chance to put their thoughts in or their experiences or their learning, any information or any um, research they've done or, or any experience of even seeing pangolins. But obviously you talked about the, the need for collaboration and collaboration across countries and collaboration across um, NGOs and, and um, charities and non-governmental organizations. And um, I think that's absolutely vital. Um, to kind of put into perspective, I'm just kind of going to look at my, my notes I made here. Um, they are, excuse me. So as you said, they were the most, the world's most trafficked non-human mammal. And um, they have been obviously the, the primary target of poachers and traffickers. And they were a sort of a big culprit of, of being sold in these wet markets. Um, as I said, these are sort of live animal markets. And a really significant thing that obviously happened a couple of years ago is um, it's believed that it was a wet market where um, oh. this pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic originated from. And I don't know if this is still believed to be the case, but certainly early on in March and April, 2020, it was um, believed that this, the source of this pandemic may have been either a bat or a pangolin that was at one of these um, wet markets. So initially there was a, a sort of a flurry to try and shut that down and, and to stop the sale of, of live animals that may spread diseases. And um, initially the pressure was on and globally attention was on that. And then as all of us naturally have endured this last couple of years of, of coronavirus, I feel like attention has moved away from the source and, 
and naturally onto the um, the resolve, onto, onto the, the, the um, vaccinations and the end of the pandemic. But I think it's really important that we all keep in mind that it's not just a, a horrific welfare issue having animals sold in, in these environments and kept and living in these environments. It, it is also um, a huge health risk, you know, and, and a global health risk. And given that the, the risk that that can, po can um, pose is essentially a, a global risk, it surely must be something that requires a global solution. You know, we, we can't think about this these things anymore as being only belonging to a problem of that particular country because we've all seen how things can expand beyond a, a host country and across the world. And, and I'm hoping that by keeping in mind the, the potential part that pangolins played in, in, in this, that we can actually see that solutions must be global and, and repercussions are equally as global. Um, the, one of the things I did right at the beginning of um, 2020 was to be, um, I was invited along to be a part of the, the launch of the End Wildlife Crime Initiative. And um, this is sort of one of my other hats is that I'm a trustee of Born Free Foundation. And this is one of the projects that they were working on. And it was actually the 8th of March, 2020, that we went to launch this initiative which is essentially trying to create a, a global response to wildlife crime. And um, that kind of happened on, it was the 8th of March. I remember that because it was um, World Wildlife Day. And um, it felt like this, this moment, it felt like we were about to have this, this moment of, of pushing through in the House of Lords, of getting recognition of this initiative. And then obviously the pandemic shut everything down. And, um, traction on that stopped and that was you know from that perspective it was a very worrying thing uh, prior to this back in 2016 um, CITES which is the convention on international trade in endangered species um, voted to ban the commercial trade in pangolins so if we think that was voted to, to be banned by CITES in 2016 but despite this commercial ban three years later in 2019 which was sort of the last um, data that we had pre-pandemic uh, pangolin smuggling had, had actually reached an all-time high um, and Malaysian law enforcement had seized 30 tons of um, mostly frozen whole pangolins and then in April 2019 there were two further record-breaking seizures of pangolin in the space of a week. In Singapore they seized 14.2 ton shipment of pangolin scales from an estimated 72,000 pangolins that come from Nigeria. So you can see this, this impact of, of uh, uplisting them on CITES and banning that commercial trade, they were put as Appendix 1 on CITES, actually did very little, if, if not the opposite, in um, stopping and regulating the sale of, of pangolins and their, their parts, which obviously goes to show that the, the effect of simply uplist, uplisting something and, and calling it Appendix 1 and, and banning it under CITES just doesn't have the, um, the legal clout behind it to, to stop that thing from, from happening. And um, John Scanlon, who is one of the people who was at this um, opening of the End Wildlife Crime Initiative, um, was saying that at, at the time, as pangolin are associated with the spread of coronavirus you know I should have been on that and he was hoping they would have been um, and that he you know his shock was that these these huge halls and these massive seizures had come after the uplifting um, so the end wildlife crime initiative began um, as a presentation in the house of lords um, and there, there was it was in front of essentially press and change makers in Westminster to um, transform the effectiveness of global response to transnational organized wildlife crime, which is essentially um, to tackle the industrial scale smuggling and the mass illegal trade of wild animals and plants. And, and it's, you know, the key there is that it is an industrial scale. This is a huge business. And um, the, the essence of what it is that they wanted to do was to create a sort of a unified global agreement 
to stop the de decline of ecosystems and the extinction of these um, endangered animals that's being brought about by the trade. So they proposed an international agreement to take the form of a new pro protocol under the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, which specifically covers wildlife crime. So at present, the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime doesn't have a, its own sector for wildlife crime. So that's kind of what was being um, hoped would be introduced, that if we could bring that up to that level, um, we could help the one million species that are at risk of extinction. Um, so certainly that is something that I'm hoping and many others are hoping is, is going to regain opportunity and traction as we move on through this um, time of, of pandemic and hopefully out of this um, time, which, which is in, in, in many ways a huge, um, well, it's obviously been a huge hurdle, but it's also a huge loss of opportunity to do something sooner. Um, hopefully we can regain the opportunity to do something about that as a notion of, of, of creating this um, global agreement that, that introduces a, a particular sector of wildlife crime enforcement of its own to give it that sort of legal uh, clout. And, and that would include as well sort of covering illegal fishing, logging and poaching. Um, it's estimated that these crimes have an annual value of um, up to 199 billion US dollars um, in, in this. So this is you know, something that, that it, it's, it's huge and it's astounding to me that the entire weight of how to manage this has been left to sort of fall onto CITES, which is really designed to be um, centered around trade agreement rather than law enforcement. And um, perhaps before I sort of get to sort of maybe legal and jargony, maybe now would be a really good time to sort of open up the floor to see what anyone's thoughts are and, and how anyone else feels that we might add value in, in what we do as both storytellers, as creatives, as, um, you know, as essentially conservationists that care about this. So please feel free if you're sort of in on the session, please feel free to put your videos on and, you know, we'll sort of have a, a bit of a chat and, you know, any questions and everything else. So, and I'll also look in the chat too. Yes. I'll change my view so I can sort of see anyone, but I so say, please, please just jump in as higher, as, uh, as you'd feel free, sort of. Great. I mean, is there anybody who'd like to sort of add anything or, or bring in their thoughts at all? Hi. Hi. Uh. Hi. Um, that was very amazing, Azi. And thank you, Kate, for this opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm from Nepal. It's like, uh, uh, it's night here, but I was so excited to join your talk on pangolin because here in Nepal, we are also going to celebrate a small virtual wall pangolin day tomorrow uh, and very excited about it. Um, uh, our organization where I'm a member, Small Mammals Conservation and Research Foundation, uh, we, we have been working on research, rescue and awareness campaign about pangolins uh, since several years. And I also had opportunity to involve on the uh, nationwide survey of pangolins. And in case of Nepal, what we observed in our field studies is that uh, majority of people usually don't have proper knowledge about pangolin, like what they feed on, where they live, what is their habitat. So because of that also, uh, pangolin, uh, um, is suffering from different kinds of threats like habitat degradation, like encroachment of human settlements towards the habitat of pangolin, and majority of illegal killing in case of our, in, in our study area seemed to be due to the superstitious beliefs like Kate mentioned, uh, and like uh, Aji also mentioned, due to the superstitious beliefs, including the traditional medicines, the also the belief about like pangolins, are bad omen and that if they encounter pangolins then it's like bad for them so they go and they want to kill it and also misbeliefs as uh, the medicines the different parts of body as a medicine for different um, 
kind of for the diseases. So uh, like people's knowledge label about pangolin, their attitude seems to have the great influence on the, like even the willingness to conjure the pangolin. And I, I, I was very excited to know about how Azi is incorporating the design take and conservation together. And it's, it's very innovative idea, I think if we could also bring such ideas in Nepal as well, and you know, that could be very influential to many people, I think to the young generations who are, you know, more inclined towards the tech and design. And I, 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 I appreciate and I like it so much. And it, it would be really nice to, you know, if there can be a possibility in future for a collaborative program where we could invite and uh, you know, um, include your creative ideas uh, in some sort in our country as well. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Sabida. Yes, of course, of course. The more share, the more we share the the innovate innovative ideas, innovative ways, creative ways to raise awareness for people. More people, especially you mentioned children that are interested in design. We could create so many different possibilities. Yes, just feel free to get in touch with Kate and I. Excellent. I mean, I was going to mention as well, one of the comments I'm reading here, the fear is born from the lack of awareness. And I think that's that's absolutely true that, you know, it's finding ways to, to reach people. And sometimes some of the, um, the more scientific a way of, of sort of approaching how to, to speak to people um, can, can read really well to people who are, science minded but we've got to keep thinking of how else you know I think there's been a lot of and I grew up sort of more reading scientific journals and you know magazines that are more science-based things like new scientists or something I used to read a lot and obviously National Geographic with its it's more um sort of factual geography and sort of more culture uh, basis to it and I think you know it, we we have to keep expanding beyond that because I think it's you know, imperative that we reach beyond ourselves and our own communities. And again, I think that's why it's great to look at um, what you're doing with the, the fashion and also look at, you know, I, um, there's some incredible people who are in the Nature Maker crowd, which is the online community that I sort of oversee of creatives, creative conservationists who are, you know, doing things like um, artwork of pangolins. And I had a slide actually that I, I might show in, in a minute of, um pangolin beer <laughs> and things like that that's like you know it's it's essentially um a, a beer brand that's raising awareness of of pangolins and um you know using artwork of pangolins on on the bottle and things like that and raising money but of course we we, we have to be a little bit careful too of like how we we talk and and bring some of those things forward because in in, in some countries and some parts of the world there are products that are actually made with um uh animal products in them you know with, with you know ground pangolin scales and stuff like that so it's like having to to be careful where we we tread where we kind of are making clear the differentiation between something that's um made with a, a pangolin product and something that's made in support of because those are the kind of things that certainly across different languages and and different cultures can be lost so I think we, we always have to kind of think so carefully about how we market and brand things and, and where and how we reach people, um, which to me is, is always the interest, you know, as someone who is a communicator at core, it's just always thinking how and where is the next place to reach the next people most effectively. And I think things like this is great, having these, these talks and these conversations um, where we can bring in people from across the globe I mean you know I, I certainly know we've got Nepal and we've got the US and we've got the UK and and um well, I think we were going to have someone who's, who's actually from Africa on on here so we can bring together obviously this global thing we've got this amazing even just this technology in in, in zoom but it'd be interesting to hear if possible a little bit more about the technology that you've worked with the, is there any more of it that's sort of communications based or, or is it all um sort of I don't know it's robotics I suppose isn't it like t tell me a bit more about the the you know the technology that you've used and how that's working yes Kate for for example a technology that 
is, uses artificial intelligence that is smart. My specific background that I worked closely with that I was managing this program was a robotic helicopter that it could fly autonomously. It could be controlled remotely with an iPad-like device, for example, with a cell phone or iPad. And the helicopter could, for example, land on its own and pick up in the future, futuristic way, it could pick up some, it could pick up a wildlife that's injured or it could pick up someone that's injured and it would be able to fly into zones that normally a helicopter couldn't land, for example, or it would be dangerous if a pilot was in it. So let's say if we had a technology such as that and we could send it to, to Africa or if we could send it to, to, to follow and go into locations that normally a helicopter can't go or something. I've also worked with, uh, for example, smaller devices, such as let's say if there's a small system site that as tiny as a little bee that can fly and, and observe what is going on, that could follow the rhino, that could follow the pangolin, or that could uh, be in that in the area that possibly the poachers go and it could immediately report the poachers, communicate that back to the the guard at the, at the guard station, uh, those technologies that are advanced in other sectors. So those are some technologies I've worked with that I know are, have been tested. And if we could just take some of those and reapply them with m minor change, changes within the world of wildlife crime in order to save the pangolins and uh, many other animals, that would be just huge. That would be a huge step ahead. And, and we've seen as well, obviously, the use of drones in conservation where we you know, drones are sort of used to, to monitor um, large um, areas of land where, you know, it might be hard to deploy people to go in and um, search for poachers. So they're able to sort of use drones to either check and see if there are poachers in the area or if there's um, you know, a presence of wildlife. So, you know, I think perhaps in some of these places where um, wildlife lives that's, that's sort of quite hidden and um difficult to reach across difficult terrain i know there are sort of certain places where gorillas are or where there's sort of salt mining elephants and stuff where it's actually hard to get on foot we've obviously had the use of things like drones to sort of monitor population numbers but i'm always interested as, as well in um the, the the look at how we deal sort of beyond that rather than sort of looking just at the where the wildlife is and, and sort of monitoring it is what do we do when we find um, people who are smuggling these things and, and how we deal with it at, at that level and both in, in terms of um, what happens in, time, in terms of legalities and um, essentially crime and punishment, but then also what's happening further upstream to sort of stop that from taking place in the first place. And um, there's a really good organization. I'm just gonna have to look up um, what the acronym stands for, but um, Eagle Network, some people may have heard of it. So excuse me while I just kind of work out exactly. Um, essentially it's a wildlife crime organization. Uh, let me see, Eagle Wildlife Crime. And um, they are incredibly effective at um, bringing about persecution of people who have been caught smuggling and poaching wildlife, because that's something that in the past has been incredibly difficult to actually enforce. So potentially people are um, caught with these mass amounts of, um, of either scales or animal product or live animals or carcasses or whatever it is. And um, they're able to sort of bribe their way out of situations where instead of being essentially stopped and, and um, that being regulated and enforced properly, they're, they're able to sort of bribe out of it. So Eagle, Eco Activist for Governance and Law Enforcement, um, Eagle Network or Eagle Enforcement, uh, Eco Activist for Governance and Law Enforcement, and you can find them at eagle-enforcement.org. And they're a really fascinating organization to sort of see how um, the guy behind it is um, so sort of founded by this, this one individual who essentially started with a, a love and an interest in great apes and chimpanzees, how um, 
he is effectively um, turning what's happening in the world into um, something that actually can be um, monitored and stopped and, and sort of creating situations where people can be made an example of. So, you know, as a deterrent, you know, I think there's no point us having these laws if A, the people that we expect to enforce them are not fit for purpose, such as the idea of making CITES um, responsible for this huge um, section of crime, which, which they, they really don't have the, the ability or the authority to do anything about. And then also when there are on the ground uh, local enforcements that aren't doing anything, we need to sort of change that too. So I don't know if anyone's heard of them or is following their work, but they're a very interesting place to look for sort of study and information about wildlife crime. Um, I'll check some of the comments here as well. So we've got um, such an informative chat. Can, how can we spread more awareness and knowledge to reach the end users to reduce the demand? I mean, there's obviously this is always, whilst there is demand, there will always be poaching. I mean, it's so true. I mean, this is where we need to sort of, I think, demystify some of these um, ideas that, that, that really aren't true about the, the properties of, um, you know, what's in Pangolin scales, you know, just to kind of communicate larger and widely that um, these, these scales have no medicinal property and it's obviously reaching the right places. Um, I think we know and need to be open about the fact that obviously a lot of this is traditional Chinese medicine. So there's a huge market in, in China, but then also beyond that in um, other Eastern Asian countries. So um, in Southeast Asia, so we have um, places like Vietnam and uh, God, I'm thinking the major players, Malaysia, Vietnam, China. Um, you know, this is where we're seeing that very strong cultural tradition of um, using these products and you know it's, it's very hard as people who don't live in in those places and you know who I have no authority to go in and, and tell anybody who lives in a different country that their traditions are wrong um, and the way I always kind of play this back out is is that here in in the UK we have a huge meat and dairy industry and I'm sure there are many parts of the the world that that think that that's absolutely abhorrent and you know that they would look at us and think how on earth can you be you know eating an animal that's as, as sacred as a as a cow and and not just eating them but so cruelly mistreating them in the process of that and so we probably seem incredibly um cruel and uncompassionate and um primitive in, in the way that, that we're doing our farming and just because we're doing it at a, at a um, large scale and an industrial scale doesn't mean that to the eyes of the rest of the world or other certainly other parts of the world that what we're doing is right and if, if we would feel uncomfortable and as many people do being talked to about that and and you know there was a big over here in the UK we had a big documentary a couple of nights ago a panorama look at what goes on in the um, dairy industry. So Panorama is a, B, a BBC um, documentary series where they do investigative journalism to have a look at what's happening behind the scenes. So, you know, they, they take a long-term look at issues that, that are often hidden in plain sight. And what they did recently is they did one on the, the dairy industry and, and exposing that. And so if we're sort of identifying this problem ourselves, it's like, okay, we can feel a little bit more comfortable because maybe it's our own journalists in our own country that's looking inward at ourselves. but initially people get very defensive when you try and speak about habits that are things that we have always done and and I I come at this as, as someone who I, I grew up in a meat-eating family I grew up um, drinking dairy I grew up having dairy products and eggs and stuff like that and, and I had to do a lot of um, readjustment in my own head to move away from that lifestyle and some people are there yet and some people aren't but we immediately get uncomfortable and so I think it's really really hard to go in to anywhere where people have memories of things you know I have memories of wonderful Christmases having you know a, a Christmas spread with my family that's you know turkey at the center of it and you know I remember hot chocolates with, with my mum and dad as a child and all these these things that feel precious and then suddenly someone wants to turn around and say well, what we're, I'm doing there is difficult and it's and it's cruel and it's you know it shouldn't be done it's, it's hard I think as anyone anywhere to not immediately feel like 
A, I'm attacked and, and, and B, it's only for business. And so I think that's always gonna be a hardest thing is, is to, uh, to look at it from the perspective of the people who we want to tell anything to, you know, it, whether you wanna go in and, and tell someone to stop killing lions in retaliation to perhaps a family member being attacked and maybe poison lions in return, or you want to tell someone that their traditional medicine that they've used, you know, their whole life and that's been passed on throughout their family and that's always been a staple in what they consume is wrong. Or you want to turn around and tell someone that their diet is, is cruel, you know, whichever one that is, that the age old problem is always how do you do that without attacking someone? You know, and, and obviously if we knew that, that would be the silver bullet to solving the problem. And, and I think the best we can do is, is really work to really understand our own life and perspectives and what we're bringing and hold our hands up in spaces where perhaps what we're doing is not perfect, you know, and, and, and we're all guilty of it. And I think we have to start first of all by, by saying, I mean, from the off like I, I'm, I'm wearing clothes right now that I don't know whether they were made you know I, I am and this is another reason why you know it's important to involve the fashion industry in this I mean I do a lot of swap shops and secondhand clothing to be more environmentally friendly but when I go upstream from that I don't know initially where they've come from and so if I have, I have to start challenging myself and talking about my um, imperfections and my things that I'm doing wrong and then maybe invite other people to, to talk about their things and you know we need to create a space that's comfortable and not judgmental that allows us to say actually I'm looking at what I'm, I'm doing and perhaps it's not perfect perhaps it's not right perhaps what I'm doing is as part of the problem and I feel like once you start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable yourself when you start saying actually I did this wrong and I did that wrong and I'm still doing this wrong I need to get better here you can naturally invite other people to, to start challenging and looking at their stuff without attacking them. I think the worst thing we can, can do is go up to someone and say, you're doing this wrong. I think the best thing we can do is spread the information and the knowledge and those little facts that might endear things or those things that might um, humanize or personify certain animals. And I know scientists will hate me for saying that because you know they, there's a lot of scientific thing that say, don't put a personality into an, an animal and, and you know, don't, um act as if they're human because they're not but in, in a lot of senses if we're going to communicate a lot of it we have to make these things relatable and so I think first of all by telling those stories giving those facts like this is more like a dog this is or a cat that you might have at home or this is you know this is a fun thing where it's like so it's really long tongue isn't that cute and you know and, and make those things that are endearing and then offer up your spaces where you're not doing things right and hope that people Put the two and two together themselves um i think that's only ever going to be the way that we influence i think we, we influence by our own admissions and and action and obviously we're in this quite scary time um of sort of social media and cancel culture and stuff like that where everyone's afraid of if they've done something wrong in the past and and that's that's a terrifying thing because it doesn't help us in this mission for sort of animal welfare or anything else of, of things, you know, being frightened of things that surface. Um, and I almost feel fortunate that in myself, like I can have a platform to hold my hands up first and say, I did things wrong. I mean, I, I've shared on my blog in the past that, you know, when I was a child, I went on a family holiday to SeaWorld and, you know, I, I bought a ticket to SeaWorld and I had no idea that what I was looking at, you know, was wrong. And I challenge myself now and think, well, how did I not know that was wrong? But, you know, I, I chose to live in that denial. I'm sure if I'd have worked harder, even as a child, if I'd have worked harder, I could have identified what was going on there. But I, I was more comfortable not. And so I made that mistake and I'm able to sort of hold my hands up first and write on my blog and say, I did this and I saw this and this is why I regret it. And, and this is what the issues are. And, and so for me, I almost give myself that opportunity of like, it can't come at me for doing something if I've already held my hands up. And I think, you know, until we start breaking down those barriers and not being afraid of mistakes and past mistakes, I probably even make mistakes now, today, even with all the knowledge that I have. Um, I think that's the only way we invite other people to, to challenge themselves. I think we talk, we talk, we 
open discussions we we be unafraid of our own mistakes and and not judgmental of, of others and I think constantly turning our perspective around to think well why is that happening in this country and why does that matter and you know in, in, in terms of the um, traditional medicine I mean often there's cases of, of literally not being able to afford um, medicine of modern science of, of not being able to, to pay for your relative or loved one to access things like cancer treatment you know and you're seeing your loved one you know maybe it's your mother maybe it's your daughter maybe it's your son you know you're seeing that loved one uh, in, in agony and you want to help them and you, you're promised a solution I mean a lot of times there are a lot of just normal people that are preyed upon in desperation and and so we have to look at that side too and not just the side of killing animals but the side of of well if we were able to provide access to the right kind of healthcare and and pharmaceuticals and you know and and, and make availability of information and internet access and all these things that are happening all around the world that I sit in an advantage position because I have access to them and if I was if we were able to to you know create a, a fairer world in that sense then then a lot of these problems would be eliminated by themselves so again it's looking at the top and looking at those systems of change and sometimes it's not just about legislation of um stopping wildlife crime but sometimes it's looking at how governance is, is treating its people and an accessibility to things you know um, sorry, I feel like I've gone off on a quite tangent, but I'm very passionate about it because I think everything in conservation, you know, these days it, it's just people led and it's just the more we understand people, the, the, the more we'll make advancements and, and the more we, we break down those barriers, those things that we think we're different. You know, I, I would probably say that if I was in the same situation and I was desperate and I wanted to help someone, I would try anything as well. You know, I, you would do anything you can in, in that moment and so we have to look upstream and say well the, the problem then is, is the lack of access to, to other things and the availability of stuff that's supposed to be illegal anyway and you know and and, and take, make take these bigger like I say it, I think it's a lie where we constantly put this whole thing on the shoulders of the individual and and make out that that's the be all and end all it's only a small fraction of, of changing this narrative um think about spreading knowledge and variance giving people facts so they can make decisions absolutely you know that's what we're hoping to do today and many of us that are sort of storytellers and bloggers is to keep sharing facts um i'm curious about I'm just checking the comments here curious about possibility of introducing similar tech to wildlife research in nepal also for keeping track of rescued pangolins released in its habitat I mean, this is something I'll be, I don't know if anyone on this call and, and please jump in and, and speak if you do. I, I actually don't know very much about uh, re-release of pangolins. Um, so if there's anyone here that, that knows anything about that, please, please let me know because I don't know what the um, success rate is or how frequently that happens. You know, the narrative that I'm often immersed in is the point when the pangolins are already dead and they're seized as you know, carcasses or, or body parts but I'm sure it must happen where the, there's intervention and some are rescued. So if anyone knows anything about pangolin rescues, you know, feel, feel free to sort of speak out. I don't know, Azzy, do you know, this is an area that you might know anything about like sort of rescue and release or maybe not? Like... I'm not familiar, I've not researched that area, but I'm definitely interested to look into that and learn more. Absolutely, and, and beyond this, like I say, I'm gonna share this video on, social media and everything and if there's anyone that comes across this and watches this and does know and can enlighten us you know please let me know and perhaps we can do a follow-on discussion at some point about the illegal wildlife trade and look at that as a, as a facet of it um yes yeah so anybody else is there anyone okay. that wants to speak um yeah. set the view up I guess I feel yeah can you hear me yes okay. I can. Yeah, uh, in India, actually, there are some organizations who work uh, regarding saving pangolin, but I have, I, I'm trying to uh, get you some reports regarding it. If I get it, I will share it in the chat. There are, I I'm, I think, I mean, it is not as much as uh, uh, what uh, they recover as pangolin parts or carcasses, but there are cases where they have intervened and uh, 
try to save some but this creature is so elusive and so i mean even in india people are not that much aware of this uh, species uh, uh, all we hear is only reports uh, regarding this and uh, whatever as i said is the most trafficked animal etc and when we see the scales coming out uh, in various uh, recovery organization or when uh, it comes in wildlife uh, crime bureau uh, news then only we come to know that these species are there so i mean how, how they are getting such a thing is quite uh, i mean uh, difficult to apprehend uh, in some cases but yes there are some cases i will try to share the report if i get it right now Hang on. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I'd be really interested in, in any of that. And again, if there's anyone on this call who is uh, or watching this back, who is a blogger or a storyteller who wants to follow up with any stories on this, you know, again, please send them my way and I'll see if I can put together, you know, a pangolin series of, you know, on a newsletter or, or just within there's the communities that I have and, and to share anything that, that anyone has promoting and talking about this species because it's still I still find it quite shocking that, uh, you know, we still don't, so many people still don't know about it and, and haven't heard of, of this species because I think I live in, in a bit of an echo chamber, you know, I, I live in this space of lots of other wildlife conservationists and, and so a lot of what I hear is, um, you know, the people who know these things and who, who talk about this and a lot of my, I look on my feeds on Instagram or whatever and it's full of people who are wildlife minded and it's really easy to forget that um, not everyone is and and you know and I always find that interesting um, when I go out and talk in, in any other social settings and any other environments whether it's a work capacity or friendships or through um, the other things I do you know I try and have those conversations and sometimes just just bringing things up and say oh I had a really interesting um, discussion the other day about pangolin and people are like about what <laughs> I think that's another way you know and and the other great thing about the the nature maker crowd is you know things that are like pangolin branded or images or deck or whatever buying gifts for people that have <laughs> this animal on is a really like good way like my Christmas shopping I like sending people stuff and you know and they're like what is this and like oh this is a chance to you know to tell you all about this lovely animal that I've, <laughs> I've come across and that can be quite effective too is to sort of subtly you know, rather than hitting everyone over the head with stuff, subtly sort of drop things in conversations or imagery, or I have a, a new picture on my wall and like maybe my family come to my house and I say, oh, look at my picture. And, and I, you know, I talk, you know, we, I think, you know, we forget just how, how powerful it is just to have conversations and just to, to, to talk and, and, you know, communicate, even in those spaces where it feels like, oh, is this the right place? Because is this the right people to talk to this about like always just talk um and then I, i'd say that because i i talk non-stop so <laughs> <laughs> african pangolin conservation who do rescue rehabilitation and release thank you carol that's definitely um i'm literally going to write this down african pangolin conservation because obviously it's world pangolin day tomorrow so any kind of extra nuggets that i'm taking out of this um chat here i'll be sort of putting into um, any sort of content I share tomorrow. So, um, I yeah, Kate, uh, currently I have shared two uh, reports, one which is uh, in December uh, 31st, 2021, and one on August. You can check that. Uh, actually, it is uh, in one case, they have radio tagged the uh, pangolins so that uh, they can get uh, uh, details about it later on where it is going, etc. So you can check those uh, reports if you want. Perfect, thank you. I've, I've picked up the link here from Indian Express. Do, um, would you feel comfortable talking a little bit about what your work is? Because I think as we're, you're on the call and you're another prominent voice and storyteller, um, please kind of take a moment to give a shout out to where we can find your work and what your background is, because that's what this is all about. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Actually, I came here to hear uh, more from you and Asi. Uh, the thing is that uh, um, I used to work uh, as a news producer for a news channel. Then later on, due to interest in nature, I took the leap of faith and currently working on sharing some of the 
uh, uh, facts in whatever way, either post, prose, or poetry to uh, general public. So uh, most of the species that I write about are those whom I have seen or observed during my travel in and around India. And uh, the, in that case, uh, now currently I am writing a set of poems related to it. And uh, uh, it is uh, published in one, one of the uh, website called Science Nectar. The one thing that I would like to say, similar to Pan, uh, Pangolin, there is another case that uh, I came to know uh, that is about mongoose. Because uh, in various cases, it is heard that the mongoose hair is used as paintbrush by artists. So now the awareness is happening regarding this. So what I did was that uh, I came to see a few species of mongoose in uh, uh, India. So I tried to write this small poem on it and uh, shared it with this website. So it is. it talks about uh, various facts about mongoose at the same time putting this planting this uh, small uh, nugget about uh, how the hair is used for uh, uh, making paint brushes so till then i was unaware about it and now there are organizations who are uh, uh, making this as a campaign so similarly there are various uh, points that i have wrote uh, it can be either connected to uh, climate change or related to poaching, related to even linear infrastructure that comes across the wildlife area and how people have to behave when they are in wildlife habitats. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm actually, as we speak, I'm just okay. collecting the links up from the comments because when I share this back as a video on YouTube, we'll drop the, the links that you've shared into uh, the description so that people can, who aren't on this call right now, can kind of have a, a look back. Um, I guess if there's, if that's, if anyone else wants to say anything or anyone wants to add anything, if not, I'll just kind of wrap up. So I just kind of, give anyone a chance. I'll have one last little skim of the comments to see if there's any, obviously what the links there, see if there's anything that we sort of missed. Um, you know, it's, it's always interesting because when you ask sort of any different group of people what the solutions are to these things, you always get a, you know, a, a different answer. So that's always something that interests me when you're in a room full of, of people who are, um, you know, into technology, in, they come up with a completely different answer. Communicators come up with another one. Um, scientists may come up with another. You know, you always find different NGOs have different solutions. And I think that's going to be really what we all should do as, as conservationists um, moving forward is, is to keep working with each other um, and, and finding ways where we can collaborate, cross collaborate. And that's again, obviously what I'm really hoping to do as much as possible with um, the community, the reasons I made the communities that I have online, the wildlife blogger crowd for photographers, storytellers, poets, uh, writers, bloggers, um, etc. Wildlife filmmakers, we've got that kind of community over there. And then I've got a community of sort of artists and um, fashion designers and brands and product creators. In the other community and i'm kind of hoping we bring them together that my, my thing i would love to, to integrate into that as well would be the like a coalition of um, ngos which is such a huge thing and there is actually something that exists within the uk and i don't know if there is globally but within the uk there's something called um wildlife and countryside link that represent they're a coalition of 65 um NGOs that are based within the UK specializing in UK wildlife and they're trying to find ways as they join this coalition and they sort of find ways of, of working together through this governing body and that's something I hope we see more of and we hope we see globally but on a small scale these kind of smaller NGOs it would be totally a dream of mine to try and create a third community of, of those small NGOs and then see if we can't get those at least three corners of the triangle sort of working together. But I mean, for me, that's that's always going to be my passion is, is to get people from 
all the different sectors to realize the value of each other. And I think there's been so much over the last decade or so, this real split in, in sort of competition of, you know, um, journalists and scientists sort of butting heads because perhaps they don't necessarily understand each other and um, different brands trying to outcompete each other or different in influences as individuals and trying to and battle. And I think we're now happily comfortably moving into a space where a lot of that is being dropped back down. And instead of seeing ourselves as so sort of um, intensely entrepreneurial, we're starting to see um, more of a case of, um, of, of people who are happier to collaborate. And uh, yeah, so anyone who with any collaborating ideas going forward, any ideas for topics, anyone who wants to speak, you can be you know, an expert or simply someone who's interested, please do get in touch with me through any of my Kate on Conservation channels and we'll see what we can do. Um, essentially the same, what we did with uh, Azzy here is we, we literally um, just, just spoke over email and you know, she said, can I speak? And I said, absolutely. So I'm always happy to, to use whatever platforms I can to help each other. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just kind of finish with just a couple of little slides that were things that I wanted to make sure that I remembered <laughs> to mention because I can have a terrible memory. Um, so we talked about that. So this is the event that, ooh, back again, this is the event that's happening tomorrow um, with the uh, Small Mammals Conservation and Research Foundation, um, which was mentioned earlier. Um, it's coming out of Nepal, but um, it's, it's, it's an event that's happening on Facebook. And I know that there's at least an, an introduction session that's in English, some of it may be in, um, a different language but at least the introduction um, is in English and there might be some opportunities to talk and, and know a bit more about that so if you have the chance at all um, to hop onto that you can find them through Small Mammals Conservation and Research Foundation on Facebook um, searching the abbreviation SMCRF as well it seems to work or there's a, a link there so that's one of the events I mean there are going to be many events happening online tomorrow hopefully World Pangolin Day and uh, obviously keep an eye out for each other's um, posts and links and shares and, and keep sharing each other's stuff you know that's how we that's how we grow is, is we we uplift each other um, so that's happening and then I, I mentioned as well the, the beer <laughs> and these are really these guys are really great so this is Endangered Brewing and they um, are one of the brands who are in the Nature Maker crowd and they um, have a sort of a spotlight focus on and I want to get this right it's Pangolin and Ethiopian wolves. And I'm gonna kick myself because I can't remember the other. <laughs> I'm gonna have a look um, of what it is that they have. Um, but essentially they, with all those, the three species that they have um, on the imagery, imagery of their beers, um, they generate um, some of their profit they donate to um, a charity that's connected with those animals. Um, so that is, Oh, it's the African wild dog. I should have known that because that's the beer I enjoyed the most of theirs. So <laughs> there's the African wild dog, the Ethiopian wolf and the pangolin. They support those species through the sale of their beer. And, um, you know, it's just a, another nice way of, of sort of seeing the, this brand and this species. And one of the charities they raise money for is Born Free, which I'm a trustee of. So I have that kind of interest there just to disclose that. Um, but you know, I just um, I just like what they do. And there's another fantastic um, member of the Nature Maker crowd, members of the Nature Maker crowd, who are doing something for World Pangolin Day, and that is uh, Petal Wildlife. Uh, you can find them by searching Petal Wildlife on Instagram, and uh, they do essentially educational resources for children. They're US based, and it's a sort of a women in business company. Um, of all females who are um, yeah, bringing education and educational materials that are, are based on endangered species. And um, they have some really nice um, stuff on, on there, some downloadables and some sort of subscription boxes and stuff like that. So that just to, to flag some of the people that are around us who are doing great things. Um, but yeah, do keep an eye out for World Pangolin Day stuff tomorrow. Keep talking, keep the conversation going, um, share, each other's and, and of course your own um, content and let's get the word out there. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much everyone who's joined us today. I'll exit my, that's where you can find me, but you probably already know that. Um, yeah, thank you everyone who's joined us today. And 
especially as you for for having the conversation and, and presenting and I look forward to seeing the um, bigger sort of uh, reveal and, and, and push of the um, the products on online I know you've sort of given us a bit of a sneak peek so I'm looking forward to seeing the launch of that probably tomorrow as well so yeah thank you very yeah. much thank you Kate thanks again for hosting this wonderful event and thank you everyone for joining us if you have any questions about how you can help any more questions about how you can help with the pangolins raise awareness how if you have questions about the technology side or any insights about how different technologies you're aware of can help save the pangolin and track wildlife crime i'm very much interested to hear from you as well brilliant thank you very much everyone and uh yeah stay stay safe and stay well and keep fighting for wildlife take care thank you all thank you. bye